Sleeping. <laughs> 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 so, like, because I'm so No, but if I just. Yeah, but he tried to refer like, to future days. That's my favorite. That is like her. It's actually excellent. That's fine. Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, good morning, everybody. We are. Uh, not in the big conference room this morning. We're in the, the split 20 or 12 20 room. And so, uh, hopefully, those who are joining us on WebEx can uh, see everything and hear everything okay. But, uh, but great. Well, uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Peniston. Uh, Dr. Peniston is a scientist here in the Department of Urology. Um, she's been uh, actively involved in the UW's Metabolic Stone Clinic since 1999 um, and uh, earned her PhD here at UW in 2004. Um, her clinic, she's a, a, a both a dietitian and a scientist, and so in her unique role as a clinician scientist in the department, she's focusing. She has focused in uh, kidney stone disease as well as uh, nutrition and prostate cancer. Uh, today's talk will be focusing on kidney stones, and also Dr. Penniston is actively involved as a core principal investigator in the Caribou program, which is a big NIDDK funded program at the national level. And in addition, for all those accolades, uh, Dr. Peston is one of the authors of the AUA uh, for, uh, uh, guidelines for kidney stone prevention for medical management of kidney stones. So uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Peston in our program. It's always a pleasure to hear from her and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me on my microphone? Um, I see we have a former fellow on the call with us. Uh, hello, Sachin. And uh, it's good to see you. I can't see you, but it's good to know that you're there. Um, I just want to start out. Thank you for that very introduction. Um, I just want to start out, if I can move the slides here, by showing you my financial disclosures. And then I want to jump right into it. And what I want to start with is um, sort of an, a broad overview to nutrition therapy for kidney stone prevention. And then I'll get into some particulars, but I thought I'd start with some real things that patients have said to me over the years. I've been here, actually, I started in 1998 when I was a dietetic intern and then became a registered dietitian, continued in the stone clinic. And as uh, Dr. Williams said, got my PhD. So I've been around for a long time. And these are some things patients have said to me, and I'm going to come back to some of these things as we go through the talk. One woman I remember told me that she hasn't eaten a tomato in 20 years. And I looked at her and I was like, why? And she said, because of oxalate. And I said, well, there's really not much oxalate in a tomato. She began to cry because she was so looking forward to eating a tomato, I guess. Um, so uh, let's see. Another guy said to me, I eliminated red meat from my diet. So don't worry, now I'm only eating chicken and fish. And as you might find out, as you find out later, if the purpose of that recommendation was to reduce the acid load of his diet, he didn't really accomplish that by eliminating only red meat. Here's one guy who told me, I don't think you know what you're talking about. The doc told me not to drink milk, and now you say I could. Um, here's uh, another one. The last person I saw for stones gave me a list of foods that have oxalate, and now I can't eat anything. That's a common sort of complaint that patients have. It's not true, but of course, that's what they, what they think. Here's a common one I get. One of the things I miss the most is caffeine. Because somewhere along the line, they've been told not to drink caffeinated beverages for stone prevention. Here's another guy. I remember this guy. He was an elderly gentleman, and he had been a very uh, eating a lot of grain. He had his own like a uh, mill, and he was like like grinding his own grains. He would buy like whole grains from the co-op and grind them and eat them. And he says, "I switched. I threw that away, and now I'm eating white rice and white bread, and and not any more whole grains. But now I'm constipated all the time." Um, here's another patient said, well, the nurse told me to stop eating nuts, but my heart doc says I should eat them. And that's a common one that we get. We hear that from patients with diabetes as well, who are relying on nuts as a low carbohydrate snack. Here's someone telling me, uh, you're, you're telling me to eat more fruits and vegetables, but they taste acidic. Isn't that going to acidify my urine? And we'll talk about that because that's a common confusion that patients have. Um, here's another one. They told me to cut out diet soda and sparkling water, but I hate plain water. What can I drink? And I will offer you some solutions that you can tell patients to that. Here's another thing. I've been avoiding black pepper, nuts, and spinach for 10 years. Why am I still forming stones? And kind of along the same lines, I've been using lemon juice in my water. Why am I still forming stones? So I'm going to kind of touch back on all these things. And first, let me ask, have any of you heard any of these things in a room with a patient? Um, so I think what's contributing here is some misinformation. Misunderstanding, they might have been told the right thing, but patients might not have understood it correctly. 
And then I call these the four misses. The other one is missing information. Um, I think both patients and providers sometimes have missing information and make assumptions that might not be correct. And then missed opportunities, which is just um, that, that we don't maybe take the right opportunity to explain something to patients or to provide them with more information. So what I hope you appreciate after this talk is that the relationship between diet and kidney stones is complex, that urolithiasis is multifactorial, there's not always a dietary contribution, that general dietary approaches, which we might call nutrition recommendations, are not always helpful, especially if a lot of changes are required. So my message will be be judicious. And what I'm gonna talk about most is an individualized approach, nutrition therapy, which is what dietitians do, has more benefits in our experience, and I'll show you some data to support that. Um, this requires you to use the available data that you have, biochemical data, all kinds of other data, to diagnose possible dietary links, to identify then in the diet the actual contributors or the suspected contributors in the patient's diet, and then to develop targeted interventions. Um, what dietitians can especially do is integrate those recommendations with other dietary recommendations that patients might have. As you know, a lot of our patients have diabetes. A lot of our patients have heart disease. So they have dietary recommendations from those areas that we need to integrate. And then of course, patients' preferences, which is a large part of what I try to do. And then my, uh, what I hope you also appreciate is that if data are unavailable, like stone composition, 24-hour urine, you're kind of guessing. And I just wanna put this idea in your heads that you might encourage unfounded opinions and perceptions about stone prevention. You might be right some of the times, but sometimes not. So if you want to hear more about the general approaches versus the targeted, come to the ROC meeting at the AUA on Monday, May 1st, where there's going to be a debate. Michael Borowski, who's a urologist at University of Minnesota, and I will be debating empirical versus targeted nutrition therapy. So stone disease is multifactorial. How do we treat multifactorial diseases? <laughs> One of the first things we do is we look for what the contributors might be, right? I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. This is stuff you all know. On the left-hand side are urinary factors that you look for in a 24-hour urine. On the right-hand side, which in the red box, are non-dietary things that could be contributing to stones for each of these urinary factors. My point here is that there's a lot. And we don't always know for sure, but that's why we have, for example, a nephrologist in our stone clinic, because he brings information about systemic um, things about renal handling of things that is very useful when we try to, you know, sort of uh, figure this out. In the middle are the possible dietary contributors, and this isn't even all of them. But my point here is that it's complicated, and that if we want to do etiology based treatment, which is what we try to do for most diseases, we have to be willing to use data to look a little further. So I hear this a lot. Um, urologists uh, ask me, well, why can't I just give my patients all of the information about dietary prevention that there is? Because, you know, I owe that to my patients. They should have all of the information, right? And I guess I think, are these changes always needed? <laughs> because here's a list of 18 things, probably not even all the possible dietary things you could tell patients. But my question to you is, are these things really all needed? And if not, why do we want to tell patients that? Because a lot of patients don't have the capacity or the willingness to make changes. I don't even. If you told me to make 18 changes in my diet, you know, I might say, well, what's my priority? I don't want to make them all. So I do want to, though, go through some examples of general approaches to stone prevention, where you might be able to say to a patient, well, data show that these dietary patterns are associated with stone prevention. And when I say stone prevention, I mean stones of all types. A little bit later, I'll talk about different types of stones and how you might cater your recommendations to those. But let's take the Mediterranean diet. You've all heard of this. Uh, there's nine categories. If you look at the Mediterranean diet, it's either in the form of a list or a pyramid. There's nine basic categories, things to follow. And these numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, correspond to the sort of natural Mediterranean regions um, of the world where these diets are, are practiced. And this has been shown to be protective against heart disease and many other things, but also stones. In fact, Leon et al. in this box over here on the right found that those who adhered the highest or the most to the Mediterranean diet had much lower odds of, of getting a stone. I think this was recurrent stone homers uh, than people who were moderate or low adherers to the diet. This sounds pretty good, right? But when you look at how people really adhere to this Mediterranean diet, there is, um, they, they struggle 
for getting more intake of legumes and fish and dairy and olive oil than the Mediterranean diet calls for. And many people struggle with limiting or lowering the amount of red meat and poultry that they're supposed to eat. So it's a complicated diet. There's nine categories, as I said, and each one of those has some subcategories as well. So, but this is a diet, a general pattern that's been shown to be stone preventive. Same with DASH diet. You've all heard of this dietary approaches to stop hypertension. It's been shown to reduce hypertension and to uh, reduce risk for heart disease. Um, it's also been shown to be protective against stones. So, but again, there's 10 categories here. And even among people who say they follow the DASH diet, really, uh, when studies look at how many of them actually do, only 25 to 30 percent of them across most studies are actually following it. So why is that? It's hard. Have you ever tried to follow it? Um, you have to do a lot of different things, and there's a lot of different uh, categories and subcategories. And when we look at the determinants of, of adherence, what what characteristics do people have that do follow it? Um, you know, it's it's patients whose baseline diets are not that far away from the DASH diet. It's patients whose cultural influences correspond to what we talk about in the DASH diet. Um, it's people of higher socioeconomic status. Um, I don't think that it costs more to eat better, but um, in our society uh, to do so requires more preparation and, and more, more, I guess, less convenience. So most people don't do it. And then people who also understand the rationale for the DASH diet and who understand what they can expect from it also do better with adherence. So I think we can take all these principles and apply them to our counseling and patients about stones. Here's another one. It's the USDA Healthy Eating Index. And we actually use this, these points um, in, the, in the second column here correspond to the points per category. We can actually use this, and people have used this, to study groups of people and how well they adhere to this guideline. Because this guideline or this pattern also has been shown to be cardioprotective. I don't know that anyone's looked at it for stone disease, but um, if they have, it, they probably find it's pre uh, preventive against stones. But again, this has about 10 categories, multiple subcategories. And when studies have looked at adherence across the US population to this guideline, uh, it's about 12%. Why is that? Well, as you can see, there's a lot of things to do here, and it might diverge a lot from patients' baseline diets. So what we found in our studies here is that adherence decreases with the number of recommendations. Um, I'll show you some data on that later, but let's look first at people who, from the CDC, people who comply with general recommendations to exercise. Um, what is it, like five times a week, 30 minutes, of whatever. Uh, it's only about 20% of Americans actually comply with that one uh, recommendation. How many Americans actually eat five fruits and vegetables daily? That's a common recommendation also. It's in that USDA Healthy Eating Index I showed you. Turns out about 10% of Americans are actually doing this. When you put several recommendations together, like who eats five fruits and vegetables and exercises according to guidelines and maintains a healthy weight and doesn't smoke, you've got less than 1% of the American people. So my point here is that adherence gets difficult the num with the higher number of recommendations. And I'll show you some data that was on that slide that we did in our uh, studies in our clinic. So I like to pro uh, promote individualized nutrition therapy. Uh, you can do this if you're even if you're not a dietitian you can identify specific things that you're going to target and give patients those specific recommendations and i often talk about this as an if then sort of statement if you believe stone factors are diet related then again we can use evidence and we can use other means to uh, determine that then dietary changes are indicated but if stone risk factors are not diet related really no amount of change is going to cause any effect in patient stone disease so I borrowed a term from you all, and I call this minimally invasive nutrition therapy. Because when you practice surgery, right, you're doing the least thing, least amount of things that you have to do with patients, the, the smallest openings, the least amount of manipulation. And I think that uh, theory can apply just as well to nutrition therapy. And really, to do this right, I think it has to be part of a team approach. I don't think that a urologist or a nephrologist you know, necessarily can do all of this. I might see 12 patients in a really, really busy day for me. You might see like 30 or 40. So obviously I can spend more time with patients and that usually is required to get really good results. So a nutrition uh, therapist, a dietitian, um, uh, can really do a great job if there are, if she has access or he has access to 24 hour urine results, the stone composition, to patient stone histories and other medical factors, to uh, access to the patient, uh, him or herself, to do a diet assessment, 
And then, of course, access to other experts who might be able to weigh in on various things related to stone disease. So there's a lot of data. Um, sometimes we don't have all these data points, but a lot of times we do. And then what are the components of nutrition therapy? Well, number one, assess the diet. Um, I know that this is not something that you all do, and that's okay. But I do think that to be really targeted, you have to do this because you have to know how the patient eats. And you have to know what their habitual diet is, not just what they ate on the day of that 24-hour urine collection or yesterday. So it's important, and we can ask questions that sort of determine this um, and get portion sizes. And I can actually estimate milligrams of calcium that a person eats on an average basis. I can estimate numbers of servings of various things that are useful. And then we look at those findings from the assessment. And I look at the 24-hour urine risk factors. I look at other biochemical data that are here in the black box. And I say, which one of these factors might be explained by one of the things I just found out in the diet assessment? And then with that information, then I can develop an individualized regimen to intervene. And that means for someone who's vegan, figuring out non-dairy ways to get calcium. That means for someone who's um, practicing some other kind of diet, you know, corresponding the diet to their, those preferences and a lot of cultural preferences too. So we intervene with an individualized regimen, integrating it with other therapies, providing strategies. That's really what I can do. I think that's useful. So I can, you know, you can say eat less salt, but then I can help the patient do that. You know, they might not never use the salt shaker, but they still eat a high amount of salt. How, you know, can they reduce that? And then um, I can also give them resources and point them to other people who can also provide them with support. One thing I'd really like to do is, uh, I don't know if you know this, but all high B stores have a registered dietitian on site. There's some other store chains that do this as well. But I thought this was a really great idea when they started this years ago and it continues today. And so sometimes I'll even give patients the card of a dietitian at a high B store locally. And I'll say, go to this dietitian, give them this paper, you know, which has my recommendations on it and have him or her show you around the store and show you how to actually purchase the things or even prepare the things that I'm telling you to do. So sometimes patients need that kind of level of support. And then of course, monitoring over time. So benefits of individualization, again, it's minimally invasive. It usually requires fewer changes. It links dietary factors to actual stone risk factors so patients can see change. And I think that's really motivating. I, I can say, look, if we lower your salt, there's a good chance your urine calcium will also decrease. And if they do it and they see the results, that can be really powerful and motivating. So here's the data I, I was thinking of earlier. We did a study where we looked at patients that we had given nutrition therapy to. And about a month later, we uh, called them or sent them surveys and we asked them to remember, uh, to recall what they were told. And people made stuff up. They, they said that I said things that I never said. They, they forgot things. It was very hard. And we figured out that patients who received three or fewer recommendations actually did better. They had better recall. And if they had better recall, they might, we didn't measure adherence in the study, but they, it stands to reason that they might have had better adherence. So this is one piece of data that I think supports this minimally invasive approach. So after that kind of intro, I'm gonna go kind of one by one through some of the most common 24 hour urinary risk factors. Um, in some cases I can explain some mechanisms, although you probably all know that, but I wanna start first with low urine volume. So you might think, well, what's what's the, you know, what's the deal with this? I just tell people to drink more. Well, there's a lot of, if you say drink more water, some patients hear that word water and they think literally that that's what you mean, that they can't drink anything else. Hence the question I showed you in my first slide. I don't like water, but that's what they said I have to drink. Well, in truth, you know this, all beverages can count towards your urine output. Even fruits and vegetables in some studies can account for up to 30% of urine output. Why is that? Because they have a high water content. So we can use the diet and many aspects of the diet to create higher urine output. So if people don't like water, this is what I'll try to do. If, if they need to increase their fluids, I'll say, do you have any barriers to doing that? Well, yes, I don't like water. Okay, great. Let's talk about non-water ways to get your urine output higher. And for that, we recommend low sugar beverages or diet beverages or, or sparkling water or Andrew Rule from Mayo Clinic just put out a study showing that caffeinated beverages are associated, are not associated with higher stone risk. So they're fine to use too. Um, some people want to uh, avoid uh, embarrassing situations because they're incontinent. So they might, you know, uh, not drink during the day. 
And so that takes a lot of working with patients to figure out when they can drink safely and when they have access to a bathroom. So maybe creating a schedule. I've done that a lot with patients. Here's the schedule when you're not drinking. Here's when you can't drink. And we'll see if you can get up to the goal. And then some people, I call this sluggish thirst mechanism. I don't know if that's really a, a thing, but uh, we do know that we can manipulate thirst with certain uh, medications. Uh, people are looking at that, but uh, some people I think just don't sense thirst or they don't respond to it. It doesn't bother them. Let's just put it that way. So in that event, you know, I might work with people to develop a schedule or let's let's uh, program your phone to beep at you every hour or something uh, to remind you to drink. Uh, we did a study. You see these bands here. We haven't published this yet, but we did a study where we gave people a fancy water bottle and it was programmed so that they could uh, learn or, or be keep track of how many ounces of fluids they had drunk during the day. And then for other people, we gave them uh, five rubber bands. And we said, put the rubber bands around your wrist in the morning. And we gave them a water bottle. And we said, every time you polish off one of these water bottles, take a rubber band off. And then by the end of the day, if all your rubber bands are gone, you've likely met your fluid goal. Or if you still have a rubber band, you better get busy. And it turns out that some people really like the water bottle. Some people did better with just the rubber bands. So the point here is that any way that works is what works. And sometimes that just requires working with the patient. Are you a techie kind of a person? Are you not? Um, you know, figuring out what their barriers are and what they can do to overcome them. And then I, I really promote the expansion of the fluid repertoire, um, really, not just water. And I think we should be careful when we say drink more water. Some patients take that literally. So let's be expansive and recommend other beverages, crystal light or you know, other low sugar beverages. And there's room for all beverages. Um, and you know, usually some guy will say even beer and I'll be like, yes, even beer, but don't leave here saying that the dietitian said you could drink all the beer you wanted because obviously that would not be good. So, but there's other things uh, that might impact a person's ability to increase their fluid intake, their occupation. How many of you have seen a patient where, where they told you, I can't drink during the day. I can't leave my post or whatever, teachers, truck drivers. These are people who struggle because of their occupation to drink as much as they need to. People with certain comorbidities struggle, people with malabsorption or chronic diarrhea. It's really hard to keep up with those fluid losses by drinking as much as they need to to put out this sort of requisite two or two and a half liters of urine. And then there are social barriers like I talked about, lack of thirst or just plain forgetfulness. So I try to go through these things with people if they have low urine volume, because we know that's the number one way to prevent stones, all stones, all types of stones to increase that. So those are just some ideas about that particular risk factor. So moving on to hypercalciuria, this is very defined, as you know, um, some people say above 200 milligrams for all people. Some say uh, women should be below 200, but men should be below 250. Some people use 300 milligrams. It's really kind of relative. You know, what you really want to do is get a person's calcium and urine down as low as you can. So um, one of the big contributors to hypercalciuria, as you know, is salt. And there's a lot of salts in our diet. You know, a mineral and a, um, a complex with an anion is a salt, right? Potassium bicarb is a salt. Um, but I'm talking here about sodium chloride. It's what we most commonly refer to as salt. And I came up with this pie chart years ago. I think Sachin, who's on the call, probably still uses this. Um, but this is data that I got from our patients. So years ago, I gave patients food scales. And I gave them diet logs and I said, keep track of your diet, weigh your foods, try to be as, as detailed as possible for four days. And I took those data, it was about 80 people, and I, I wanted to find out where their salt was coming from. Because I had heard so many times, this laboratory test is wrong because I never use a salt shaker, but you're telling me I got a lot of the salt in my urine. And I was like, I need something to tell my patients, uh, you know, to show them that I'm not just, you know, uh, lecturing them or, or assuming that they eat a lot of salt. And so what this allowed me to do was to tell patients, look, most of your salt is not coming from the salt shaker. I get that. So you might not be using the salt shaker, but you could still be eating a lot of salt. And we can see the sodium and the chloride in the urine, right? You can multiply the sodium by 23 because that's the atomic weight for sodium. And so because our sodium in our 24 hour urine reports are reported in milli equivalents, it's not really helpful if you're used to looking at sodium as milligrams. Multiply that by 23 and tell the patient what that is. And sometimes they're like, whoa, I ate 8,000 milligrams of sodium. And, you know, sometimes that can be really eye opening. But the major contributors to salt in the American diet are breads and baked goods. And then things like processed meats, luncheon meats, and then, of course, canned foods and cheese, 
cheeses are very high in salt. People don't realize that most cheeses and then salad dressings, salty snacks. And some people have, you know, very little intake of salad dressings. For example, others have more. So I can use this pie chart and I can say, let's figure out where your salt is coming from and focus on ways to curtail, you know, those particular foods. So this has been really helpful. But one of the other things that contributes to hypercalciuria is the potential renal acid load of the diet. Why is this? Because when we're in a state of metabolic acidosis, which most of us are most of the time on a Western diet, we rely on bone to buffer that systemic acidity. What is bone releasing when it's buffering? It's releasing calcium. That's actually not the buffer. The buffer is phosphorus, but you don't just get calcium released from bone. It's complex with phosphorus. So it has to release phosphorus, calcium comes with it, and then the bloodstream at any one time is high for calcium. And you all know how tightly regulated the bloodstream is for calcium. It cannot really go out of range. Your body will defend that range against all odds. You could be a bag of jello, and your, your bloodstream is not going to alter, well, I'm exaggerating, not going to be altered for calcium. But the point is, when there's too much calcium in the bloodstream, the kidneys kick in. They do their job. They grab that calcium, they excrete it into your that's the origin of hypercalciuria in, in the setting of acidity. So what foods contribute to the acid load? I've circled them here. It's meats, so all meats, not this red meat, but fish, poultry. Um, Dr. Best did a study when she was a fellow at UT Southwestern proving that it's not just red meat that can cause or that can contribute to acidity. So, um, but then it's also, this is what I think is really important. Grains are high for acid load. So see this, this uh, category here, grain products, bread, flours, noodles, spaghettis. This is a hidden sort of high source of, of acidity in the American diet. And I'll show you some data later that um, came out of a study that I did with a dietitian at University of Chicago. So cheeses are also high in acid load. And I'll tell you why that is, because a lot of people wonder why that is. Why isn't milk? Because you can see here, like um, milk, where is it? Uh, milk and dairy products are like one. So that's hardly acidic at all, right? Because the positive number is acidic, the negative numbers are alkaline. Why is there a difference between milk and yogurt and kefir and cheese? I can explain that for you if you'd like. But anyway, what foods contribute to the negative acid load or alkaline load in our diet? Well, these turn out to be fruits and fruit juices, vegetables, and beverages. And why do these contribute to the alkaline load? They've got to go back to the Krebs cycle because every turn of the Krebs cycle produces how many moles of bicarbonate? Two. So you get these organic acids that are really plentiful in fruits and vegetables. They're in their anionic form. So like malate, citrate, succinate, tartrate, and they are converted to bicarbonate through the Krebs cycle. So mostly in the liver. So we get benefit from eating these foods. Uh, we not only get all the nutrients in them, but we get bicarbonate. So that's why vegetables and fruit and fruit juices and also some other beverages like coffee and beer are actually net negative for acid load, meaning they're alkaline. And then I always like to point out that milk and the non-cheese dairy products are basically neutral for acid load. So this is very important because I think a lot of us, um, you know, we have a lot of patients who experience this. Uh, but I want to point out some, if you're going to use this with patients, that this scale that I showed you here is very um, uh, abounds, and you can find this in literature. I've, I've used it a lot. Uh, Thomas Reber was the person who came up with this. But you'll see it expressed in different ways. And sometimes it's expressed as uh, millet equivalents of acid per ounces of food or per milligram of food. You'll see this with oxalate, too. You'll see a list of high oxalate foods, but it won't be per serving. It'll be milligrams of oxalate per 100 milligrams of food. And that's where people get the idea that black pepper is really high in oxalate. It is when you look at a list of oxalate per 100 milligrams of black pepper. But when's the last time you ate 100 milligrams of black pepper? Probably never. So it's really not a high oxalate food if you consider a serving size of pepper is a shake, right? Well, the same with egg yolks. You look at this list of prawl, and this list, it's kind of hidden here, but this is mill equivalents of acid per three and a half ounces. Looks like egg yolks are really high for acid low, 23. On the previous list or on a, on a different list that I'll show you, it's like four. What's the difference? It's that measurement difference. Per serving, one egg yolk has an acid load of like four. But 
because an egg yolk doesn't weigh three and a half ounces, <laughs> um, multiple egg yolks will give you 23 milliequivalents of acid. So beware of these kinds of lists and look at the measurements. Uh, but you can see on the negative side here, all these different vegetables, uh, tea, um, coffee, you can see all these things have very, very negative numbers, meaning they provide that alkaline load I was just talking about. And here's that data for eggs. One egg yolk is 17 gram. Or, no, that's not right. Um, anyway, the amount of acid load that it provides here is four. When we look at it in terms of, you know, three and a half ounces or something, yeah, I guess that's right. Um, it turns out to be a lot higher. So be aware of those kinds of things. Um, and interestingly, the egg whites have components in them, even though there's, that's where the protein is, have components in them that provide an alkaline load. So it's the egg yolks that are actually more acidic, which is kind of interesting. Um, and people always want to know why is cheese so acidic when milk and yogurt is it? It's because during the cheese making process, the acidity rises. So here's a table from Dairy Science Journal where the product starts out as raw milk. And you can see that the acid load, which is the y axis here, is very low. And then you can see as it goes through the various stages to mature milk, to coagulum, to the stirred grains of curd, to the drained curds. And then at various aging times over here, cheese aged at 21 days versus 28 versus 42, you can see a constant rise. That's why cheese is high for acid load. It's because of the cheese making process. Now, fresh cheeses are not high for acid load. So fresh cheeses are like ricotta, um, cream cheese, Neuchatel, uh, but those are the cheeses people are putting on their burgers for the most part. So what do we do when we suspect or we, we determine that a person's hypercalciuria might be in part related to the acid load of their diet? What I try to do is add foods, not subtract. So I don't say to people, well, you gotta you know, you know eat less meat. Um, they might not be eating that much meat in the first place. Um, I saw a lady, this was just a couple of months ago. She weighed like, I don't know, 110 pounds. She was an avid runner and she was uh, had, had, had pretty aggressive stones for the last 10 years of her life. And she was really committed to to stopping them. So somebody had said, well, you know, eat less meat. And so she began to eat less meat and she came to me and she was borderline iron deficiency anemic and she felt awful. And I calculated or estimated the amount of protein she was getting in her diet. And it was like 30 grams and her needs were like 50 grams a day. So she took that piece of advice to heart, but someone gave her that advice because they didn't really know what she was eating. Okay. But that's why I say, be aware of subtracting foods. I say add foods. You know, you, you might not be able to cure a guy, you know, who wants his big steak and, and, you know, wants to eat it, you know, a couple times a week, but you maybe can get him to eat more fruits and vegetables. And that's why this scale here shows that you can use that equation sort of mentality rather than you got to take something away. You can use the equation to say, well, if you're going to do that, then let's up your intake of fruits and vegetables. So I really like to promote that. And if you're subtracted foods, be specific. Is it meats? Is it portions of meats? Is it grains? Um, I'll go after grains first if I can, because usually that's what is providing people with sort of unnecessary calories and then cheeses. And then I also uh, caution you against using the term animal protein very broadly, because some people consider milk, well, milk and yogurt and kefir, that is animal protein, um, or it's a food that has animal protein in it. So it confuses patients. So um, I might use the word animal tissue to be really specific when I'm talking about meats or fish or, or flesh foods, people don't like that term, <laughs> or foods with a face or um, anyway, so be specific and be aware that there's some misunderstanding sometimes that patients have when you talk about this. And this is just data from a study that I did recently with a colleague of mine at University of Chicago. And we took uh, people's four day diet records. They had weighed their foods and gave us good diet records. And we looked at the acid potential of their diets. And on average, people were getting a lot of alkaline load from beverages, coffee, tea, um, alcohol, uh, like beers, um, and vegetables and fruits. And then they were getting most of the acids from meats and grains and combination foods, casseroles, things like that, and cheeses. So I don't know that it's necessary to go through the, the, the individual acid load of single foods like I did a few slides ago. I don't really think that's necessary for most patient counseling, but knowing about food groups is very useful. So like this table is very helpful. Well, you're eating a lot of grains and meats, your diet is pretty high for acid, let's just balance it with more alkalinity. And that I think is a sound approach. Moving on to hyperoxaluria. Um, and we can, uh, I'll have time for questions after this, so you can ask specifics. And I think I'm spending some time with residents after this meeting, so we can get even more specific. But um, 
what I want to start with for hyperoxaluria is probably not something you think of a lot, but it's the gut bacteria. So it turns out that we have evolved, um, people that have looked at paleolithic diets and ancient diets, turns out we've evolved on a diet really high for oxalate because we were like foragers. We were eating grain, we were eating seeds, we were eating um, root vegetables and you know anything plant food that we could and there was a lot of oxalate there, but we developed a huge microbiome in our digestive tract and many of those bacteria can eat oxalate. And what I think is the big news here is, um, especially for those of us who've been in the field a while, we used to always hear about this one species of bacteria called oxalobacter formigenase. And we were, a lot of us thought, well, that's the only bacteria that eats oxalate, right? And it turns out that's not true, thankfully, right? Because it's hard to just colonize one specific species of bacteria. Um, this is a study that I collaborated with, on, uh, with uh, Aaron Miller at Cleveland Clinic and Dirk Lang in Vancouver. And we looked at people's um, stool. So it's a surrogate for digestive bacteria. It's not perfect, but it's a good surrogate. And we found what these notes here show is that there was oxalate degrading potential in many different species of bacteria, but that it looked like there, there had to be some level of cooperation between them. So it's a, it's a new frontier that, that people are studying what, what groups of bacteria together have the biggest or the most potential to degrade oxalate because it's not just all about oxalobacter anymore. So this is good news and it really supports the idea that we need to diversify and increase the breadth of our gut microbiome, which any disease, you wanna Google this, any disease state that has looked at the gut microbiome, almost everything finds that the more diverse your gut microbiome is, the healthier you are. I think that will prove to be the, the story of the stones as well. Well, how do we do that? Most of us are exposed to antibiotics in our lifetime and we don't eat the fruits and vegetables um, because why is that important? Well, we get most of our prebiotics, which are the, the foods, if you wanna think of it that way, that the bacteria need to live from fiber. And most Americans don't get enough fiber to support a really good um, gut microbiome. So <clears throat> the message here is that there's a lot more work to be done but that it turns out networks of bacteria are responsible. And it might not just be about the probiotics themselves, but about prebiotics and making sure we're getting enough of that to sustain really healthy gut bacteria. So stay tuned on that. But more directly, um, Dr. Nakata and I, this is over 10 years ago now, did a study. We, we took patients with hyperoxaluria. So the top graph here shows all these patients had um, urine oxalate of more than 45 milligrams. And you can see over here on the right, some of them had really high urine oxalate, 100, 90, but most of them were kind of in this middle range of 40 to 60. And we identified two groups within that. We said, you're gonna make changes to your diet um, with, by including calcium containing beverages or foods at your meals. That's what you're gonna do. And I counseled them on that. The other group we said, use calcium citrate with your meals. And we took uh, those, the data and we found that all of them, the bottom graph here shows that all of them shifted to the left, meaning all of them had lower oxalate on either of these strategies. There was not one that was superior to the other. Um, but the point here is that we can increase the amount of calcium in the diet, probably particularly timed with meals to compensate for a high oxalate diet. Why would we want to do that? Because a high oxalate diet is a marker of a healthy diet. In fact, when I was a grad student, I studied vitamin A, something completely different than what I do now, but we looked at carotenoids and we found that we, we were looking for ways to confirm that patients or that people were eating uh, certain amounts of fruits and vegetables. And one of the measures we looked at was urine oxalate. It told us something in, in addition to other factors about it corroborated some evidence that we had about their intake of fruits and vegetables. So why not just say though, eat less oxalate? I want to be, uh, point this out to you because I think it's fairly important. First of all, I wrote an article in the AUA News last year. Um, I'll dig it out and, and present it to you guys if you want. But I, I showed that the low oxalate diet doesn't really, hasn't really been um, tested that much. You know, most therapies we have, whether it's a drug or a medication, there's been a lot of testing on it, right? Studies that showed its efficacy. Well, if you look for the low oxalate diet and what tests have been done on it, it's really not very many. So I think we need to raise the bar for what we consider to be a bona fide therapy. And that's one thing. But the other thing is that Nuri et al. did this randomized trial where they showed that a lower intake of oxalate led to a lower intake of fiber. Makes sense, right? They had less phytate in their diets and phytate is an inhibitor in urine of calcium stones. They had less intake of bicarbonate precursors, less magnesium, 
and less antioxidants. They also had lower excretions of phytate, citrate, and magnesium. And we know citrate and magnesium are inhibitors of stones. Citrate, an inhibitor of all calcium stones. Magnesium, specifically an inhibitor of calcium oxalate stones. They also had lower urine pH, not necessarily good. Um, and they had higher urinary excretions of calcium. They did have lower oxalate excretion, but in the setting of all these other things, their supersaturation index for calcium oxalate was not lower. So this is why I, I want us to be careful when we're saying to lower oxalate. Um, and also, uh, we'll just take this uh, table, for example, the foods that you might say uh, that people should cut out are also those foods that have the highest amount of magnesium and fiber and alkaline loads. So again, you know, I, I realize that, you know, people are using spinach in their smoothies and stuff like that, but think about, um, you know, whether they're making that smoothie with, with yogurt or milk, you know, something with calcium in it and how much spinach they're using. One lady the other day, actually, this was just yesterday. She said that she loves spinach, loves it, and she eats a lot of it. And so she told this to the doctor and he said, well, just cut out the spinach. So I like to explore terms like love this and a lot of this, because that means different things to different people. It turns out she was buying a bag of loose leaf spinach, you know, you've seen those in the store, right? And she was distributing that across five days. She would take a salad to work with her every day, mix leafy greens, and she would use a little bit of the spinach, you know, each of that. So I calculated that five, you know, doses of, of spinach in this bag wasn't really that much oxalate. And that if she could pair that meal with, with milk or yogurt or something, we might be able to allow her to eat that spinach and enjoy all the benefits, but not get so much oxalate absorbed. Because as you know, calcium and oxalate bind in the digestive tract, forming an, an insoluble complex. So neither the calcium nor the oxalate that are bound are absorbed. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about oxalate for now. Um, I want to move on to hypocitraturia. And I want to put this idea in your head uh, that it's, it's complicated, that there's a lot of things that go into the excretion of citrate but that it's a lot about acid. And I talked to you in, the, in great detail just a minute ago about acid load of diet. Um, urine citrate is a really great marker of acid retention in patients with CKD. And it turns out that we can use this in patients without CKD as well. So if you ever work with Dr. Jay Gru at Metabolic Stone Clinic, you'll notice he looks a lot at serum bicarb to sort of corroborate what he's seeing in the urine for citrate. And that can give him a clue as to you know, the amount of acid that a person might be retaining, whether there might be renal tubular acidosis as a, a contributor to it or, or what. But you can see here that people on a standard, you know, sort of acid producing diet, like a Western diet, they're producing 10 units of urine citrate, and then they have less uh, reduced EGFR, maybe five units of citrate. Look at this, 30 days of eating more base producing fruits and vegetables, the amount of citrate that they excreted was higher. So this is being looked at actually in CKD, this alkalinization concept as a way to slow the, the progression of CKD. But I think it's useful for stone patients as well. It points to the importance of adding fruits and vegetables as a way to combat that acid load. And I always tell people with low citrate, you might need medication. And certainly if you see urine citrates of 100 or, or often less than 50 or whatever, or even 200, they're never probably gonna be able to solve that problem with diet alone. So I try to manage their expectations and say, look, there's no amount of lemon juice you can squeeze in your water to make that citrate go as high as you need it to go. Sure, you can use it if it helps you drink more water, but you might need medication. But if you eat more fruits and vegetables, maybe we can keep you on a lower dose. And that's often very attractive to patients. And then I also wanna, I'm not gonna talk about this today. Uh, I'll be talking about it at the AUA meeting though. Uh, magnesium handling appears to be related to citrate. Um, and this is due to some uh, coordination of magnesium and citrate handling in the kidneys. And so people with low urine magnesium and low citrate, in some instances, you might not be able to get their citrate up unless you also address their low magnesium. And Dr. Antar and I will be doing a study on this any day now. <laughs> um, there's also over-the-counter things we can use to alkalinize urine. As we know, the pharmacologic uh, uh, use of, of potassium citrate has gotten really expensive. That has forced us all to look for other solutions and in some cases create solutions. So there's a group of urologists that created this thing called litholite. Uh, nephrologists and urologists created this thing called moonstone. Uh, we use a lot of plain old baking soda. Works really well, it's really cheap. Uh, but there's a lot of different options now, which is really attractive because we can, you know, look at what a patient wants to do and is willing to do. Um, 
and I'll skip that slide. So the last thing I want to talk about is uric acid stones. So I've talked mostly about calcium stones uh, because things that influence hypercalciuria or things that influence oxalate in the case of calcium oxalate stones. Here I want to talk just about uric acid stones. It's really not a problem of uric acid in the urine. You can have somebody that's got you know, double the amount of uric acid in the urine that they should have by the, by the common sort of ranges that we go by. If their urine pH is like 6.5 or higher, they're not going to form a uric acid stone. It's about the pH. So instead of maybe delving into diet and sort of, you know, you gotta eat less purines and patients like less of purine and, you know, let's just talk about increasing that urine pH because data show that if you increase that urine pH, even if you don't address other aspects of the diet, you can reduce their stone formation and maybe even outright eliminate it. And since people with diabetes have tend to have lower urine pH, Dr. Best and others have looked at this. Um, we know also that better control of diabetes leads to a higher urine pH. So sometimes controlling diabetes is a part of the therapy for reducing uric acid stone formation. And dietitians are very helpful. So I just wanna end um, with a couple of slides and then open it for questions and comments. So what if you don't have, and this happens a lot, right? You're seeing a patient in surgical follow-up, you don't have a 24 hour urine, you might not even be gonna get one. You don't have a stone composition and you're not gonna assess the patient's diet and you wanna know what can you tell patients. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, is the patient asking for something? You know, because if they're not, maybe we don't need to go there just yet, but what can you do? Well, you could assume that they're forming calcium oxalate stones, right? That's a reasonable assumption. It constitutes what, like 80% of all the stones we see? You could assume that their diet is somehow improved, if not primarily, then somehow. And you can assume that you know how the patient eats and you can provide a, a list of all the possible things that they could do um, and let the patient decide, well, I'm already doing this one, not doing this one, doing this one, you know, but that's a lot of work for the patient and a lot of assumptions. What I want maybe to, for you to think about is to be honest with the patient about the multifactorial uh, nature of stones and to tell them that diet really isn't always related, but it might be and to acknowledge the importance of personalized therapeutic approaches. You know, I'd love to be able to give you some great advice. We really need some more data. We need a 24 hour urine collection from you. Are you willing to do that? And if so, maybe they can be referred to me or to our stone clinic. And, you know, so I think that we can encourage those additional tests, acknowledge that we require the expertise of other team members. And, um, you know, as a bottom line, you know, we can tell all patients to make sure that their urine output is, is ample and dilute. Um, I think we can tell all patients to, you know, if they're not already eating lots of fruits and vegetables to do so, I think those are safe things to do, but I'm not sure about going much further beyond that because it leads to a lot of those questions that I showed in the first slide. Um, why am I doing this? Um, I'm gonna skip, well, this is one of my notes. I took parts of it out. If you look at my notes, which um, if I've seen a patient, you should look at my notes the next time you see the patient so you know what I did. And I also have a lot of history and medical history in my note, it might save you some time. This patient has eaten red meat in six years and he doesn't drink milk or eat yogurt because he was told not to do these things. He was told to eat a low oxalate diet and to use lemonade or citrate and to avoid red meat. Now this, this whole regimen was devised with no stone analysis, no 24 hour urine results and no comprehensive diet assessment. So, but yet the, he was told these things. When I assessed the diet, I found that, uh, and when I got 24 hour urine, I realized there was no hyperoxaluria. So probably no need for a lower oxalate diet. There was no hypocitraturia. So probably no need to use lemonade. Um, and there, he was certainly eating a lot of meat, just not red meat. So I addressed the acidity of his diet and the fact that he was eating four cups of white rice a day. That's just weird. And certainly, as I showed you the grains, um, it provided part of the acid load. So, you know, we think we're not doing harm with nutrition recommendations, but I think sometimes we might be. And so I just want us to be aware of that. And then I, I want us to be reading the literature. Um, you should all read this new study put out by Andrew Rules Group at Mayo Clinic. He did a epidemiological study from the Olmsted County uh, well-characterized uh, group of people. It's observational, but he showed that a normal calcium intake is associated with lower risk for um, an incident stone, that certainly more fluids, more potassium, was significantly uh, associated with less incident stones and more phytate in the diet. And where do you get phytate? From all those high oxalate foods that I was talking about. And notice caffeine, um, no effect. So it's not gonna increase the risk of stone, it's not gonna prevent it, but it's not gonna increase it. And then he also looked at recurrent stone formers and found virtually the same sort of uh, findings. 
So it's okay to have caffeinated beverages as long as that's not all you drink. Um, and it's certainly okay to use dairy, as we can see. So um, I always caution you to give long lists of things to patients because some of them freak out. They're like, wow, changing all these things, that's that's crazy. Um, and it's not easy for patients to do. So I use approach an approach like this where I might have a handout that has a lot of information on it, but I'll check the boxes. I put these check boxes here. So you can say, these are the things that you need to focus on the most. And even for oxalate, I might say, it's not because you're overeating oxalate. To me, that's like saying your diet's too healthy. Uh, but it's because you're not eating enough uh, calcium to compensate for all that oxalate. So I'll check that box as well. So again, what I hope you appreciate after this talk is that there's a complex relationship, that diet is sometimes involved, but not always, and that an individualized approach, if possible, might be the best approach. And at the AUA, I'm going to be in a plenary session, I think right after Dr. Neighbors plenary session on lasers, is it? And my session will be um, a debate about um, what do patients really need to know for preventing stones. Um, I have yet to talk with Dr. Shaw about what he wants us to do here, so I'm not really sure. Anyway, but then there's also the Rock Society meeting on Monday, which if you go to the AUA, please feel free to check out. So thank you for your interest in stone prevention and for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, I'll be brief. Uh, so there's, it's a comment, not a question. Apologies. So the first thing I would say is I'll be there for your debate, and I could think of nothing more daunting than debating you on uh, nutrition and stone disease. So poor Dr. Borofsky uh, needs to worry and get ready. Uh, I think you know the thing that's most important here is actually you know since Chris. Uh, has been with us since 2005, you know, her initial uh, approach, you know, was really the educational one. And she, she was brilliant at educating our patients. And then her great passion for this area then led her to innovation, you know, uh, of these recommendations and management strategies. And, and now, sort of at the peak of her career, you know, she's become an international authority uh, in this area that she had a great part, in fact, in creating. So I think for the younger people in the room, you know, to me, you know, we're very fortunate, obviously, to have Dr. Peniston here, but more importantly, uh, you know, this is the roadmap, I think, uh, to become really a true uh, leader, you know, in a significantly complex and intellectual area. So congratulations. Thank you. But questions or comments for Dr. Peniston, Dr. Best. Thanks. I just wanted to second Steve's uh comments first and say, you know, I think we don't we're all just used to having brilliant minds like Chris around. And so we we don't know in our own institutions necessarily how many amazing people we work with and that sort of thing. But um, Dr. Peniston is certainly extremely well known and beloved uh, in our urology role. But my question is, could you speak to the whole uh, salt calcium thing a little bit more about how urologists were always so afraid to use baking soda because of the sodium, if you could delve into you know, do we think it's the chloride that is causing hypercalciuria or or what? Uh, great question. Um, as I said, we're using sodium bicarbonate a lot, which is baking soda, to alkalinize urine. And it works really well. It alkalinizes the bloodstream as well. And so for that reason, nephrologists have been using sodium bicarbonate for decades um, without fear of exacerbating hypertension or hypercalciuria. It turns out it really is the chloride ion. So when the sodium is complex with chloride, that's where you get that expansion of extracellular volume that induces hypercalciuria and probably also the pathologic of, of beginnings of hypertension. You can look in the hypertension literature and you can look at very old studies and you can look at rat studies and they will confirm this. It's the chloride ion. So when sodium is complex with bicarbonate, you do not get that same effect. And if, if it was, nephrologists wouldn't be using it um, to the extent that they do to, as, as I showed you now, for CKD. So it's a very effective alkalinizer. 
But what then about potassium chloride, for example? So nephrologists also use, you know, potent, well, and other doctors use a ton of potassium chloride historically. Does, has anybody studied, does that yes. cause hypercalciuria? No, well, not to the same extent that sodium chloride does. Potassium is going to be a confounder, but what about? But calcium, potassium chloride will acidify by urine. Potassium bicarbonate will not. So again, you're seeing a difference between the chloride and the bicarbonate. So there is something peculiar about the chloride, and there's a lot of studies that you can look at to the, show you some mechanisms for that. But potassium chloride, as far as I know, does not induce the expansion of extracellular bond, but it will acidify urine. Great, uh, Dr. Gerard. We're well, bringing over the cancer table here in a little bit. The, uh, yeah, thanks, Chris. So, one, one that aspect I was thinking about is some people just get kidney stones, and you feed somebody else the same diet, they don't get kidney stones. There's this sort of background of genetic diversity that plays a role in this. How often, and you know, you have obvious things like renal tubular acidosis, you know, these genetic abnormalities, but but how often for the average individual is that being looked into? Is that something in the future? Uh, how do you work that into your Yes. So hence the multifactorial nature of stones, right? He's right. You can feed two people the same diet and one will get stones, one won't. There's something going on. Um, now we're also learning that you can feed people the same diet and one will gain weight and one will not. So there's obviously genetic influences and nutrient gene interactions that are getting more attention and research. And there are now in stones more genetic testing being done. We're not doing so much here. Um, Dr. Jack Brew and I have talked about really kind of stepping up on this, but some centers really are using a lot of genetic testing. Finding out, for example, that there's probably multiple types of primary hyperoxyluria. We've identified three. What if there's 50, you know, that are expressed to different degrees? Same with hypocitraturia, same with hypercalciuria. There are some uh, vitamin D. Uh, genes that regulate vitamin D, for example, that could be responsible for some of the hypercalciuria we see. But I think that has a lot to do with it. That's sort of in the area of personalized medicine or precision medicine that we're definitely going to in the future. So I think it's only going to get better. Great. Well, th thank you very much as always, Dr. Penniston. And, and thank you in advance for your time with the residents later this morning with the Resident Education Conference. Um, unfortunately, although we could go on for a while with you, uh, we're going to switch over to Journal Club, uh, which is also focused on stone disease. Uh, we'll take just a minute to regroup and get the microphones to, uh, to the team. And uh, thank you again. That's right. I'm just going to tag her. Yeah, you're right there. Got some yeah, we have another yeah. um, He told her because he, he can her. feel it when he gets high blood pressure and he's metal feeling it. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to get over it. Like, and I said, well, that I makes it. Move it. It's like I can't move it. <laughs> you're like, it's right over where I need to be. Oh, it's going to be your consult I just want to let you know that would make sure you like here. Yeah. Because it's going to be half of a sip. And when we were there this morning, I saw a long metal bar. I acknowledge hypertensive. So I also.